then. Let's begin with a simple explanation of the class trial. During the trial, you will encounter spoilers for Danganronpa 1, Danganronpa 2, and Danganronpa V3. Thank you. So this is a sequel slash remake to a video I made back in 2016 about Spike Chunsoft's Danganronpa visual novels. Viewing the original video before this is not necessary. That analysis was a sort of comparison between the series' first entry and the more popular Ace Attorney series. Both have players view the narrative through the lens of a main character, who must defend clients and occasionally themselves while solving murder cases. The visual novels are broken up into a series of chapters which generally consist of rising action, investigation, and trial for one of these crimes. Despite their segmented nature, all Ace Attorney and Danganronpa visual novels also have a larger thematic narrative, which acts as a through line for all of the game's cases. This allows for a high-stakes final chapter which leads to a generally satisfying conclusion to the experience. The massive amount of similarities between these products would lead one to believe that they are ripe for comparison, but in the years since making that original video, I've come to realize that the act of comparing these two series isn't quite as useful as one might expect. Sure, these games may have similar premises, but they play out in completely different ways. When Kazutaka Kodaka and his team made Danganronpa, they weren't trying to make Ace Attorney. The teams behind both projects had different goals and objectives in mind, and it's fairly obvious that these two very different series aren't drawing inspiration from each other. So instead of comparing and contrasting, let's look at Danganronpa as Danganronpa. What was Kadaka trying to do with this series? I think it's pretty obvious, he was trying to tell a captivating story. That in and of itself, telling a captivating story in the interactive medium is insanely challenging. In fact, it's so hard that most forms of interactive storytelling avoid it entirely. The Metal Gear Solid games are known for their story, but those games often don't use the interactive medium to tell that story. Instead, they generally relegate the narrative to non-interactive cutscenes where you watch the narrative play out. This isn't telling a story through the game, rather this is a film placed inside of a game. And in Metal Gear Solid's case, it really is a film. The fourth game has over an hour of content which requires absolutely no input from the player. Around the same time as the first Metal Gear Solid was being developed, Valve Software came up with their own cheat. Cutscenes in their games happen in-engine, enabling players to maintain control of their character while the narrative plays out. This is the equivalent of placing a film in your game, but crafting a theater to put the film in. The added ability to control one's character doesn't affect the film itself. Interactivity still isn't being used when telling that story. So what's wrong with telling a story through the interactive medium? Well, it's that word, interactive. Interactive means choices, choices mean branching paths, and branching paths are a problem. Why? Well, imagine you're watching your favorite action movie and you're watching that final climactic scene with the hero fighting the big bad villain. Then, out of nowhere, the movie pauses and a prompt comes up on screen. What happens next? Two options pop up. The first is to keep fighting, and the second is to give up and let the villain win. The movie won't continue playing until a choice is made, and that choice directly affects the outcome of the rest of the movie. On a surface level, this may seem like a sort of improvement to the movie in a way. Giving the consumer more control over the art they're consuming could, in theory, make the experience more immersive by turning what was previously a passive experience into an active one. But in reality, the existence of this choice actually harms the overall product. Consider the question again, what happens next? What kind of things would a user consider when making that decision? Perhaps they may consider things like curiosity, intrigue, uniqueness, but all of those things rely on the ability of the user to reset the question. If a user is curious about a weird choice, then they can select that option with the knowledge that they can rewind the movie, presumably get back to the menu, and choose the other option. So instead, let's imagine this choice is permanent. You're at the menu, but once that choice is made, you'll never have the opportunity to make that choice again. Every time you watch the movie from then on, the ending you initially chose will always play out. Now things like curiosity and intrigue are less important, because the most interesting ending may not necessarily be the most fitting ending. At that point then, there are only really two major factors which the user will likely consider before making their decision, and they all have to do with morals. The first is how the user would behave in that situation. If the user was in the role of the main character, what would they do? Would they give up, or would they fight until the end? Essentially, this factor gives no consideration to the character in the film, and instead focuses on the viewer's personal beliefs. The second factor does the exact opposite. Instead of considering what the user would do in that situation, this factor serves to focus on the character in the story. If the main character did this and this, then maybe this choice would be the more logical one for that character to make. What would the character as we know them do when presented with this situation? 
This is where the problem with this approach becomes more apparent. While this choice may satiate some degree of curiosity within the user, ultimately there is only one correct choice for each of these factors. Especially in an instance where the decision is in a climactic scene with clear good and evil parties, it's highly unlikely for both options to be considered reasonable when only considering one of these factors. The answer to this question will be fairly cut and dry regardless. If you as a viewer would consider yourself to be closer to what is perceived as the lawful good side of the ethical spectrum, you're probably not going to choose to let the bad guy take over the world if you were in the hero's shoes. And if you're closer to the other end, then more power to you. Similarly, by the time a film nears its grand finale, there's been a lot of time for the main character to develop. It's unlikely that the hero is here just because they feel like it. Instead, it's more likely that there is something at stake, whether it be a love interest, a treasure, the fabric of the universe, or maybe even the hero's own life. While there are great stories which have strayed from the hero's journey formula, it's probably safe to say that, in most cases, the hero is probably not going to abandon everything they stand for to let evil triumph without putting up as much of a fight as they could possibly muster. So the viewer has won correct choice, and the character in the film has one correct choice. What now? Well, if those two things match, then the decision for what to choose is easy, and in most cases it'll probably be the first one, where the hero does what heroes are supposed to do and save the day. If that's the case, then the other choice doesn't need to exist. Its only purpose is to satiate the curiosity of an audience member who wants to know what happens if they or the character choose to do something directly against their own moral standards. And if this choice is permanent, then that curiosity probably won't be enough to supersede the feeling of completeness associated with a character doing something that feels morally good for both them and the audience. What does this tell us? It tells us something that probably could have been explained in less time, that the mere existence of choice doesn't necessarily make something better or more interesting. In many cases, ignoring choice enables storytellers to focus on crafting a single compelling narrative with interesting characters and compelling plot points. Despite this, developers of interactive software have been trying to tell compelling stories through interactivity practically since the dawn of the medium. While many titles do cheat with their narrative, some have still attempted to make interactivity core to the narrative experience, and in many cases they have succeeded, especially in the adventure game genre as companies like Sierra, LucasArts, and eventually Telltale found ways to give players options while still having a satisfying and occasionally even emotional story. But while Danganronpa certainly has some elements which are similar to those adventure games, its approach to narrative is more like that of the earlier Kojima and Valve examples. It doesn't even try to give players control over how the narrative plays out. Kodaka and his team decided that the story they wanted to tell was too particular to have any branching paths. It was going to be a story with twists and turns, well-developed characters, and climactic moments. But while Metal Gear Solid has stealth action gameplay to complement its linear narrative, Danganronpa doesn't have anything else. Danganronpa is its plot. So any interactivity the player has with the game serves to push that plot further forward and nothing else. So if Danganronpa is presenting players with choices in a linear narrative, then that means it's essentially trying to do what that previously mentioned action movie setup is trying to do. It's presenting you with the illusion of choice, but at the end of the day, there's only one right answer. This in and of itself isn't a bad thing at all. Danganronpa is a series of interactive visual mystery novels, so extending that sense of mystery to how the players interact with the novel itself is fairly logical. Instead of having players watch characters argue over how a certain event plays out, they can search through the wealth of evidence at their disposal to figure out what the right answer or isn't selected from the menu themselves. The class trials almost exclusively serve that purpose. Every single event or game within one of these class trials can ultimately be reduced to that exact choice. While non-stop and mass panic debates are full of energy and intensity, they are in reality nothing more than a fancy menu. The Logic Dive and Psyche Taxi games are quite literally a multiple choice question set with an obstacle course skin placed over top. Hangman's Gambit is a single fill in the blank question, and the closing argument is nothing more than a simple matching game. All of these trial events are exciting not because users have any control over what happens, but because they keep the audience engaged in the events playing out on screen in an active, but ultimately inconsequential way. So Danganronpa is this choice expanded across an entire interactive product, and it uses those choices not to give players control over how the plot plays out, but to immerse them in the narrative in a way that a simple passive viewing simply cannot. It gives a set of options with only one correct option, and assumes that the player will eventually pick that one correct choice when armed with the knowledge the game provides them. By far, the biggest issue with the Danganronpa visual novels is that this doesn't always happen. Let's reframe that action movie choice by replacing it with a specific scene from one of my favorite action movies, The Dark Knight. After all, Batman Ninja is a thing. If any Western action hero is going to be compared to a Japanese anime-styled visual novel series, it should be him. 
About halfway through the movie, Batman's arch nemesis, the Joker, has been captured, and Police Commissioner Gordon sends our hero in to interrogate the Big Bad. Through his interrogation, he learns that the Joker's henchmen have captured two people, Batman's childhood friend and love interest Rachel, and her current boyfriend and Gotham District Attorney Harvey Dent. Both people are trapped in two buildings on opposite sides of the city, both rigged with explosives. If Gordon agrees to attempt to rescue the other person, who should Batman try and save? The character's choice is fairly obvious. Batman goes to the location where he believes Rachel is, because he cares far more about her than Harvey Dent. But given that Dent is the district attorney of Gotham, and at this point in the film is a role model and hero to a number of Gotham residents, it's arguably more logical for an unbiased hero to go save him instead. If the user chose Dent, then that would be distinctly against the character of Bruce Wayne, but it may be the choice they as a user would make if presented with that exact situation. Ultimately, the choice in the Dark Knight ends up not mattering, because the Joker played another trick that makes things a bit more complicated, but the contradiction between what the user would do in that situation and what the character would do in that situation is important to understand regardless, because these choices come up a lot in Danganronpa, and they aren't always resolved so smoothly. In Games Critique, this problem is described as ludonarrative dissonance, in which the actions a player wants to make directly contradicts the actions the controllable character wants to make. In some cases, this sort of complaint doesn't really hold any water, because it uses minor plot contrivances as a means to justify the complaint. Why is Nathan Drake going around murdering hundreds of people while acting like a pacifist? Because it's a video game, and shooting people with guns in a video game is fun. The point of Uncharted's plot is to get players from here to here, and little else. It gives context to the events playing out on screen, and gives purpose to the massive set pieces and climactic moments. It can introduce characters and sequels and rewrite the game's own history, because its plot doesn't matter nearly as much as its... gameplay. But Danganronpa is its plot, so its ludonarrative has to be held to a higher standard. If it's broken, then the whole experience is broken, because that's all it is. Yeah, what he said. I, I agree with that. That's some good stuff right there. I'm down with that sickness. The simplest example of this occurs about halfway through Trigger Happy Havoc. Every character in Danganronpa either has or is supposed to have an ultimate talent. That's because they all enrolled at Hope's Peak Academy, a school for talented people. But something went horribly wrong and the ultimate students are now forced to kill each other. Makoto Naegi is the ultimate lucky student and is our main protagonist, and Kyoko Kirigiri, whose ultimate talent is unknown, is his partner in crime of sorts in the latter portion of the narrative. Makoto learns of a possibility that fellow student Sakura Ogami, the ultimate martial artist, is acting as a spy for Big Bad Monokuma against her will. When Kyoko asks about it, the player is presented with a choice to tell Kyoko about that information. This is actually a fairly difficult choice for a player to make. Both Sakura and Kyoko are equally likable and equally mysterious. We don't know everything there is to know about either of them, but they both have performed a number of selfless acts in the story up to this point. Despite this, the narrative has certainly placed a larger importance on Kyoko than Sakura, prepping players for Kyoko's larger role in the novel's final two chapters. As such, it seems logical for many players to want to tell their arguably closer ally any and all information they can obtain. But if players select that option, Makoto doesn't let that happen. He insists to the player that no, he needs to speak to Sakura first before he tells anyone else about what he saw. This isn't a wrong or a bad decision by any means. In fact, it's the only decision Makoto would ever make, because that's the kind of character Makoto was designed to be, someone who wants to verify all information before making any rash assumptions. Through not disclosing information he has no definitive proof for, he's following his character's moral compass and doing what Makoto should do. What the player wants to do in that moment is completely irrelevant. So the logical question to ask after that is why this choice was even presented to the player in the first place. What is the purpose of presenting players with a choice choice on how things play out if their input doesn't matter. Well, Danganronpa wants this choice to be equivalent to this choice and this choice in terms of how its plot plays out. It wants players to treat these choices as if they're unraveling a mystery, with only one correct choice and a number of wrong choices. The problem is that while this choice and this choice have evidence and context to guide players to the right answer, this choice doesn't. And that's certainly going to throw players off if they choose the wrong option. Here's another example. Chapter 5's trial revolves around the murder of Mukuro Ikusaba, who is known by the rest of the cast to exist but was never formally introduced. For a decent portion of the novel, there is an assumption that Mukuro was the mastermind responsible for holding the students hostage in a high school and forcing them to kill each other through controlling the Monokuma robots and ridiculous number of security cameras. Finding the body of this mysterious assailant, and then discovering that Monokuma is still functional, is the sort of double gut punch to throw the plot for a massive loop and skyrocket player interest. On on top of that, the body itself explodes, leaving very little evidence to go off of for investigation. 
Naturally, the investigation and trial don't go particularly well, but a few loose threads eventually lead to a bunch of steel arrows being the presumed murder weapon. These arrows were found in a locker, the key to which was found in Kyoko's room, but could only be accessed by ultimate affluent progeny Byakuya Tagami, who has Kyoko's room key. Makoto has evidence which verifies that Kyoko had access to a room despite not having the key, and that she is lying to everyone in the room. Makoto was given the choice to call her out, not call her out, or run away. Just like the prior choice, there was only one correct option here. But also like the prior choice, it's not entirely clear which choice is right. So the question comes up again. Does the player's logic line up with the character's logic? What is the right answer? And what happens if you choose the wrong answer? Well, the most obvious wrong answer is to run away, and that answer is treated with a short dialogue box deeming that option unreasonable before reverting back to the choice. This is similar to practically every other wrong choice in which the player is immediately told that they are wrong and brought back to the choice. The right answer of these choices is to play along with Kyoko's lie and let the trial play out without your key piece of information. She says earlier that the whole case is a trap designed to frame Kyoko for a murder that Monokuma and the mastermind controlling him actually committed. By playing along with the lie, Kyoko is proven innocent, but Makoto is deemed guilty instead in a clear act of desperation by Monokuma. He's nearly executed, but is saved by the surprise return of the group's AI friend, Alter Ego. This progresses the plot to the final chapter. This move, for Makoto to lie to the group for the sake of one other person, goes notably against Makoto's character up to this point in the story. After learning that his prior closest friend and potential love interest, ultimate pop sensation Saika Maizono, was planning murder and was killed as a result of a failed attempt in the first chapter, Makoto has exclusively focused on using hard evidence, tangible things, and verbal contradictions in the class trials. But by the end of the story, Makoto uses hope itself as his evidence, eventually defeating the mastermind, ultimate despair Junko and Oshima, by convincing the rest of the group to trust each other in spite of a lack of real proof. This choice by Makoto is the beginning of a transformation in his character. The problem is that, despite the insistence that Kyoko's lying is in good faith and that Makoto needs to play along with it for the mastermind to be unmasked, there is still a real chance that players will make the wrong decision regardless. And unlike every other decision in Trigger Happy Havoc, the option to call Kyoko out on her lie has a respective ending attached to it, an ending which fails on a number of levels. Immediately after making this choice, another non-stop debate begins, in which players are forced to prove their point by revealing the existence of Monokuma's secret tool, a master key of sorts. This is the evidence that both Makoto and players knew about which proves that Kyoko had access to her room. Afterwards, Kyoko admits defeat and states, as she had before, that the whole murder case was a trap and that, despite attempting to, she failed to escape the trap. Then, Kyoko is executed without the intervention of Alter Ego, despite her being in the same position as Makoto would be had the other choice been selected. Monokuma spontaneously decides not to introduce any further murder incentives and largely stays out of the lives of the remaining survivors. In addition, Ultimate Swimming Pro Aoi Asahina is impregnated by every remaining guy and bears children from all of them, despite the fact that these children presumably would also not be allowed to leave the academy. And the other surviving woman, Ultimate Writing Prodigy Toko Fukawa, also presumably died, despite their not being a trial for her. In short, this ending is a plot hole ridden joke, and when it finishes, players are brought right back to the choice as if nothing happened. And while this may seem like a fairly harmless optional tangent, it doesn't play out nearly as well in person, and it doesn't do anything other than confuse the player more than they likely already were. It also completely destroys the thematic and emotional importance of Makoto's character shift with what is effectively a badly told joke. It's the equivalent of watching the entire rest of that action movie example play out with the wrong choice, being actively mocked by the movie for making that choice, and then being reverted back to that menu without any added context. But while this so-called ending is terrible, that's not the real problem. Rather, it's the likelihood that players would make that wrong choice in the first place. No amount of lengthy cutscene and interpersonal monologue can change the fact that players have been wanting to discover the truth in this visual mystery novel, and the correct option is to go directly against that base instinct. So while this decision makes sense for Makoto, it just plain doesn't make sense for the player. Whoa, dude, that's, yeah, that's, that you hit the nail on the head. You, I agree completely. You seem like a, a very intelligent young man. 21, I assume. This difference between Makoto and the player carries over into the final chapter, where, as previously mentioned, Makoto is using hope as his evidence instead of something tangible and real. When the real mastermind is unmasked, the trial turns into dramatic reveal after dramatic reveal as the characters learn more and more about the reality of their world. That the family and friends of all the cast are likely dead, that the planet has fallen into despair, that the security cameras in the school were being used to provide a sense of false hope to survivors, so on and so forth. 
The idea is that when Makoto uses the evidence he gathered throughout the investigation phase, he's playing right into Junko's hands, as these hidden truths are, in reality, the greatest despair for these characters. It isn't until Makoto convinces these characters to disregard all of that in favor of hope and faith in one another, that the mastermind is able to be defeated. The problem is that, while the characters are rendered speechless after these crazy reveals, players are likely to find themselves mashing buttons just to get through it all. From the moment Junko is revealed, we already know how the story is going to end. It just takes another hour of explanation to get there. Largely, pointing out issues of ludonarrative dissonance in the first Danganronpa is a form of severe nitpicking. That's because, aside from that one criminally bad instance in Chapter 5, these problems are minor enough that players are likely to suspend their disbelief enough to not notice them. And if these complaints are the biggest issues in Trigger Happy Havoc, that makes it a pretty solid visual novel, all things considered. This makes its sequel, Goodbye Despair, that much more impressive, because it managed to fix most of these issues, leading to a far more satisfying conclusion and overall experience. While Makoto's character struggle largely dealt with placing trust and hope in his peers and circumstances instead of hard, tangible evidence, the struggle of the main character of Danganronpa 2, Hajime Hinata, has to do with the exact opposite, coping with the provable reality of the circumstances he's in and using that knowledge to change the future. It's a moral transformation which better aligns with the interactive experience players are having. See, the overarching plot of Goodbye Despair starts to gain momentum in its fourth case, easily my favorite case of the entire trilogy. It's a mystery that admittedly has a fairly obvious culprit after some deductive reasoning, but makes up for that lost ground with one of the most mind-blowing settings and circumstances I've ever witnessed in any art form of the mystery genre, one which is enhanced by the interactivity players have with the world. We'll get back to this case a little bit later, but for now, the key development takes place when players take control of a character other than Hajime. Nagito Komaida is this group's ultimate lucky student, but unlike Makoto, it's an actual talent. We take control of Nagito in order to clear the final dead room, this insane puzzle box of a space that is rightfully insanely difficult to clear and thankfully skippable for those who can't solve it. Once it's solved, Nagito is forced to showcase his ultimate talent. The scene which plays after the dead room is cleared hints at Nagito's discovery of a key truth in how Chapter 4's murder played out. But he actually learned a lot more about the nature of the killing game this time around, which doesn't come to fruition until after his murder in Chapter 5. Fast forward a few hours and the cast of characters learn that they're all in a simulation designed to save their souls from despair. In fact, it's the first question in that chapter's trial. If this is a game, are my words being displayed in a text window right now? Every one of the ultimate students in Danganronpa 2, with one notable exception, was actually brainwashed by Junko to spread her prophecy and destroy any hope that humanity had left. The Future Foundation, which the survivors of the first killing game work for, created the simulation with the goal of filtering out all the despair and restoring their hope and goodwill. This simulation was infected by an ultimate despair virus, bringing a simulation of Junko and Monokuma by extension into the game. Even better, we learn that this virus was actually planted by Hajime himself. Well, actually, it's a bit more complicated than that. Hajime's entire identity doesn't even exist in this world outside of the simulation. Unlike every other student in the entire series, Hajime doesn't have an ultimate talent, so he volunteered to undergo invasive surgery as part of an experiment by Hope's Peak Academy to create artificial talent. When the whole world fell to despair, Hajime, under the new name of Izuru Kamakura, chose to infect the simulation with the ultimate despair virus. It's quite the complicated narrative, but Goodbye Despair does a better job at explaining it than Trigger Happy Havoc did with its twist. The entire purpose of the trial is for the students to make a simple choice. This time, there are two options, graduate or repeat. If a majority of students choose to graduate, then, with headmaster approval, they will leave the simulation. If a majority of students choose to repeat, then, with headmaster approval, they will reset the simulation to how it was at the start. The catch is that the headmaster is Monokuma as a result of the virus and not Usami, the intended friendly rabbit headmaster of the simulation. So just like Chapter 6 in Danganronpa 1, Monokuma's goal is to pull back the curtain and overwhelm the cast with reveal after reveal of despair-filled truth, that the world is a simulation, that Hajime put Monokuma in the simulation, that the cameras were used to lure the future foundation into the simulation, that graduating would upload the virus into the deceased students, and so on. But then something changes with how this trial plays out. Makoto and two other cast members from the first Danganronpa enter the simulation, having been lured by the aforementioned cameras, and introduce a third option into the choice pool, a secret shutdown mechanic which would abort the simulation entirely. This final option is the only way to fully remove the virus from the simulation, but Junko reveals that doing so is likely to erase the memories of the characters from within the simulation. In Hajime's case specifically, that would effectively be a form of suicide. 
Makoto encourages the cast to completely ignore anything Junko says and to place hope in him and the future foundation. But Hajime largely rejects this approach, opting to learn more about his circumstances instead. In fact, it was Makoto's blind hope that put the group in this situation to begin with, as he himself admits when stating that he cannot guarantee that there are no issues with the program during the investigation. That's the key thing Danganronpa 2 does differently. It introduces an element of ambiguity to this thematic battle of hope and despair. In the first entry, hope was the clear best option Option, as it was represented by the character the player was controlling, but this time it's not quite so clear. Most of Nagito's character arc centers around his desire to witness true hope by acting as a sort of indirect adversary to the rest of the cast as they attempt to solve murders. Once he discovers the truth about the remnants of despair, he sets up a nearly unsolvable murder with the goal of killing off the entire cast. If hope is represented by someone like Nagito or Izuru, is hope really the right option? This ambiguity applies to the choices presented to the player as well. After hours of bonding with with these characters, the idea of essentially erasing all of that for the sake of some greater hope is less agreeable than something as simple as voting for Junko to be punished in the first entry. Even if a player may already have their own idea of what the right decision might be, the weight and consequence of such a decision will likely help players relate more to the character's inner conflict. No more mashing buttons, it's total investment in the narrative. Hajime's decision is that he can't make a decision. He loses consciousness in the trial and awakens in a dreamlike state, bearing witness to a theoretical game reset in which he doesn't have to think anymore. But Chiaki Nanami, ultimate gamer who is built into the simulation with Usami, encourages Hajime not to believe in talent or hope or anything besides himself. If you can't do that, no matter how much talent you possess, you will never be confident in yourself. So when he wakes up, he convinces the others to not choose between hope or despair, but to create their own futures instead. Forget the choice, forget the system, just close your eyes, shut the game down, and deal with whatever comes next. Don't be mindlessly hopeful, don't trust people without reason, don't strive for talent. Instead, just be yourself. You won't be able to do it! You won't be able to do anything! No, that's, that's wrong! wrong. Ultimately, Hajime's choice did align with what Makoto wanted, and ultimately, the fact that they retained their memories after the game was shut down is nothing short of dumb luck. But the rationale behind the choice, and the struggle which led to Hajime's character development is likely to resonate more. In addition, the player was never asked to make this choice, but merely to consider it, because in this moment where the main character is undergoing a key transformation, the developers chose not to risk the importance of the plot for the sake of a meaningless choice. Instead, they crafted an ending which would keep players engaged without having to make a decision. Just as the inclusion of a choice made a key moment in the first Danganronpa worse, the removal of choices from Danganronpa 2's ending made it that much stronger. Nothing wrong there. F***ing top stuff, mate. This brings us to the V third entry in the series, Killing Harmony, a title which brings the issues discussed to the forefront of its interactive experience in a way which shoots its narrative in the foot. And because Danganronpa is its narrative, V3 doesn't pan out nearly as well as its predecessors as a result. The key new mechanic introduced in Killing Harmony was perjury, the ability to lie during trials. In court, this is a serious offense for fairly obvious reasons, but it's fair to say that the court cases of Danganronpa are fairly abnormal already. From a pure narrative perspective, there are no real holes here. But but the problem comes with who is being forced to lie. Not the characters, but the player themselves. Earlier in this video, we talked about how Danganronpa is this choice expanded across an entire interactive product, and he uses those choices not to give players control over how the plot plays out, but to immerse them in the narrative in a way that a simple passive viewing simply cannot. It gives a set of options with only one correct option, and assumes that the player will eventually pick that one correct choice when armed with the knowledge the game provides them. But in V3, this is no longer the case. Lie bullets can be used in place of truth bullets, lies can provide alternate paths through trials, and lies can be believed by the rest of the cast and never addressed later, sometimes to the point of being contradictory. The illusion of choice is no more, and in many cases, players appear to have a direct input into what happens next in the trial. So now we're back to the same questions as always. What choices would the player make? What choices would the character make? And do those choices line up? Similar to some other examples brought up previously, the the decision to lie or not is purely a moral choice, meaning that there is no clear right option when approaching these situations. Some will try to lie all the time, others will lie infrequently, and others still will avoid lying whenever possible. In many cases, the scenarios around which these choices are framed may play a factor in whether or not the player chooses to lie. 
Shuichi Saihara, meanwhile, is a specific character with a specific character progression. His character lies out of fear due to a traumatic event in his backstory. He's the ultimate detective whose role is to uncover the truth, but when he does it, as he does in the first case, the consequences are traumatic. V3 attempts to make players relate to Shuichi's plight by giving players control of Kaede Akamatsu during Chapter 1 and forcing them to discover that the character they were controlling is actually the culprit. It does a great job at subverting expectations, but it also doesn't function quite as cleanly as the opening case of the first Danganronpa, where both Makoto and the player establish a relationship with Sayaka in the same way. As Shuichi grows, however, he eventually integrates lying as being a key tactic in order to elicit reactions from other people in the group. He uses it only in situations where it makes complete sense to do so. In any given trial, Shuichi is only going to lie two or three times on average. But naturally, most players' moral leanings are unlikely to perfectly match that of Shuichi, and it's often unclear when Shuichi actually wants to lie. Because the choice is given to the player and there is no single correct option, the burden of moral integrity falls on the player and not the character. Some players may use this as an opportunity to experiment whenever possible, but in equally likely use cases, players forget that lying is even an option. In theory, both practices are reasonable enough until moments come up where the player is forced to lie, an occurrence which happens at least once per trial. In some cases, players are primed before the applicable non-stop debate with a bit of inner monologue, but just as the primer in Trigger Happy Havoc's fifth chapter isn't guaranteed to prevent the bad ending, the bit of text here is more than likely to go over the heads of a few players. In addition, this primer simply doesn't exist in certain circumstances in later cases. Shuichi's also a really bad liar. Most of the time, when he he lies, it's fairly obvious that he's grasping at straws. Most of the cast buys the lie, aside from Kokichi Oma, ultimate supreme leader, who makes it extremely clear that he knows what Shuichi did. The scenario which plays out after a lie takes place provides negative feedback to the player, even if it leads to a positive outcome in the long run or is necessary to progress. The more this happens then, the more players are likely to be pushed towards avoiding perjury whenever possible. Killing Harmony would have been far better served had it made perjury its own separate minigame instead of being a deliberate choice players had to make during a non-stop debate. Most of the minigames play out far more smoothly in V3 than they ever have, with V counters and similar changes making for easily the best versions of the non-stop debate, Hangman's Gambit, Rebuttal Showdown, and Closing Argument, along with really great additions like the Mass Panic Debate and Mind Mind. Making perjury a separate minigame removes the thrill of players making their own decisions, but that privilege has proven not to work well in both Danganronpa V3 and the series past. But lying isn't just a mechanic in Danganronpa V3. It's a key thematic hook which permeates throughout the entire narrative. Bears do not lie. Bears do not lie. While the hope versus despair conflict is still actively discussed in Killing Harmony, it plays a secondary role to the battle of reality versus fiction and truth versus lies. The biggest example of this thematic battle outside of the more overt final chapter is the fifth chapter, which has to do with the murder of an unknown character, either the previously introduced Kokichi Oma or ultimate astronaut Kaito Momoda. The idea is that one of them is dead, and the other one is hidden inside this mechanical robot called an Exosol, and no one, not even Monokuma, knows who is where. Throughout the trial, the Exosol changes voices and positions to play the roles of both Kokichi and Kaito. The general assumption by the cast at first is that Kokichi is the one inside the Exosol, but the cast grows more and more confused used as the trial plays out. It's a fantastic way to represent the truth versus lies theme within the visual novel. There's just one problem. As soon as Shuichi said, Is that really you, Kokichi? Towards the beginning of the trial, I became fairly certain that it was Kaito inside the Exosol, and I was right. But in the trial itself, Shuichi begins to doubt his initial conviction. One of his closer friends, ultimate child caregiver Maki Hawakawa, fuels this doubt through her unwillingness to accept the possible truth in the same way Shuichi didn't want to believe that Kaede was the culprit of the first case. Around a quarter of the way through the trial, the characters were largely running under the assumption that Kokichi was the one in the Exosol, while I as a player believed it to be Kaito. This is when the Exosol switches voices from Kokichi to Kaito for the second time and explains its voice alteration feature. The Exosol asks Shuichi to prove that Kaito is the one that's still alive, leading Shuichi to ask what story the evidence tells. He follows this up with an inner monologue stating that he cannot run from the truth. I took this to heart, and when presented the option, I chose Kokichi Oma as the victim of the fifth case. But just as a seemingly correct choice can lead to an insultingly terrible bad ending in Danganronpa 1, this option is the wrong choice for this question. In order to progress the case, players need to choose Kaito as the victim. In a title full of uncomfortable lies, this is easily the worst of them all.
Why, yes, Matt, I totally agree, and I'm trusting you to not put this clip after anything you've said that might be construed as uh, controversial or um, inhumane. But where there are lies which completely break any sense of presence players may have in the narrative, there are lies which fuel the narrative at its very core. Maki isn't a caregiver, she's an assassin. Kaito, the ultimate astronaut, never even went into space. Kibo, the ultimate robot, wants to be treated like a human. Kokichi lies so often that it's hard to keep track of them all, and by the end of the narrative, it becomes clear that the entire story of Killing Harmony is all a lie in a way far more substantial than the virtual world of its predecessor. In more ways than one, Danganronpa V3 embraces its status as an entry in a long-running fictional franchise. The title makes direct and indirect reference to its predecessor so often, it starts to feel like a joke. The main setting of the fourth case is a simulation which shares the name of the simulation from Goodbye Despair, the Neo World Program. The sword from the opening case of Trigger Happy Havoc plays a key role in this title's third case. The characters of Killing Harmony resemble and reference the cast of prior entries as well. Kurumi Tojo's selfless devotion as the ultimate maid is comparable to Peko Peko Yama's devotion to Fuyuhiko, and both are the culprits of the second chapter of their respective novels. Kaede and Sayaka serve practically the same exact role in the narrative, even if their motives to kill were different. Both Danganronpa 2 and V3 have robots, although one sticks around for longer than the other. There's one character not native to Japan in every entry, there's one female athlete in every entry, there's one scary looking huge person person with a heart of gold, these characters are certainly unique and well written, but the list of similarities is too long to simply ignore. The cases even mirror prior cases from other entries in the series to the point that they feel like inferior ripoffs. The first case deals with a close ally being directly involved to subvert expectations, the second case has the killer move the body, the third case is a double murder with a locked room element, the fourth case requires the understanding of an unfamiliar setting in order to solve, the fifth case is rigged in some capacity, and the final case is a retrial of an earlier chapter which serves to overthrow the mastermind. This doesn't necessarily make these cases bad, as the second Danganronpa also took a number of ideas from the first. The key issue is that, aside from the first and third chapters, these cases are generally easier to follow than those from their predecessors. Given the nature of Killing Harmony's final chapter, it's fair to assume that the developers made this title with the expectation that players went through Danganronpa 1 and 2 before jumping into V3. As such, it's reasonable to expect these cases to do something to confuse players instead of hitting the same beats with many of these trials. But Killing Harmony rarely does this instead opting to change out certain aspects of one case for other similar aspects of a different case. Easily the worst instance of this is the fourth chapter, which largely takes place inside that Neo World program simulation. The main crux behind the murder is the fact that the edge of the world loops back on itself, something which certainly would be confusing to a character within Danganronpa, but after already solving a more complicated case in the prior entry, it's more likely for players to catch on earlier than the developers were likely expecting. There was so much more going on in Goodbye Despair's fourth chapter than the Killing Harmony equivalent. The strawberry and grape houses feel distinctly alien, and their disorienting aesthetic aligns with the motive for the chapter, the lack of any food for the entire cast. Where a secret within the virtual world ends up being the motive in V3, Danganronpa 2 had a different motive and completely separate secret through the final dead room. In addition, the time taken to solve the final dead room and uncover the secrets within gives more for the player to think about on top of an already complicated case. In many ways, the chapter 4 trial and Goodbye Despair is equally a murder trial as it is a look into Nagito's psyche before he goes completely off the wall in the next chapter. Meanwhile, the Killing Harmony equivalent drags on and on as the characters slowly work out something that the player likely already worked out. But while this case was arguably the least interesting of the bunch, it does very little in the way of directly impeding the narrative experience through its interactivity. Just because it is likely that a substantial number of players will have figured out this case long before the characters in the story have, that doesn't necessarily make the design of the case bad. A player could easily find themselves in the same situation on a more complicated case if they happen to think through things properly. So Kanaka Kazutaka deserves some credit, because it's essentially impossible to craft a means of interacting with a linear visual mystery novel that ensures that no player will ever think through things slower or faster than the characters in the story. Despite the issues with interactivity in Danganronpa, the narrative itself has largely held up. Believe it or not, the fact that the cases in this title mirror scenarios in prior entries is actually important to Killing Harmony's story. Narrative beats which could be written off as lazy in other titles are likely to be completely intentional in Danganronpa. Discounting the poorly received Danganronpa 3 anime, the only time the narrative in a Danganronpa title became a major source of criticism was with the ending of Killing Harmony, easily the messiest and most divisive chapter in the entire franchise. In reality, however, the narrative on its own, or at least the intent behind it, still largely holds up. 
The major problem is that the story of this entry is way too ambitious for the minimalistic interactive experience that Danganronpa is. We already saw Killing Harmony seems in its fifth chapter, but it's at the end of the novel where the entire interactive experience almost entirely falls apart. That's largely because the chapter is a meta-commentary on Danganronpa and fictional media in general. The chapter opens with an individual named Makoto, of no relation to Makoto Naegi of the prior entries, who claims that his life is sad and useless, but finds courage through something on his phone before claiming he's rooting for whoever's on the program he's watching. This is a sort of hint at what's to come later, as Makoto is essentially a generalization of the main cast's true identities. The entire cast volunteered to participate in what is actually the 53rd Danganronpa entry, having their memories wiped and crafted anew into characters they said they wanted to be in order to participate in the so-called ultimate real fiction. This reality isn't totally revealed until after Ultimate cosplayer Samugi Shiragane is revealed to be the mastermind of the killing game. Up until that point, the chapter is chock full of references to the outside world, intentionally tricking players into thinking the dialogue applies exclusively to the destroyed society outside of the academy and not the world outside of the Danganronpa universe. There are even times when they joke about this not being a fictional universe. Kibo wishes to destroy the academy and kill everyone in order to end the killing game for good, but Shuichi and the rest of the group think that taking things to such extreme measures is going too far. This is the decision by Kibo himself, which he makes clear when stating that his inner voice, this nebulous thing he references throughout the story, stopped talking to him. I used to hear my inner voice with perfect clarity. It would fill me with the power of hope, guide me along the right path. I can't hear it anymore. All I hear now is silence. In reality, this inner voice is Makoto and people like him in the outside world who are watching this killing game play out. We'll get back to this. Monokuma and Kibo start fighting, slowly destroying the academy through the turmoil. Kibo gives the group until dawn to find all of the evidence they need to challenge Monokuma in a trial, but this deadline has absolutely no effect on gameplay. The current time is represented by a bar at the top of the screen, but if the marker reaches dawn, the player is merely set back a few rooms and the marker is pushed back a bit. This lack of a true failure state displays an assumption by the developers that players will suspend their disbelief in the same way they do when suspicion is drawn towards the main protagonist after failing a trial minigame regardless of whether it narratively makes sense or not. Once the group gathers more information about their supposed situation, they challenge Monokuma to a retrial of the first case, as there was evidence which suggests that Kaede didn't actually commit the first murder. But as they go over the evidence and figure out that Samugi actually killed Rantaro, Shuichi discovers a number of inconsistencies between so-called flashback lights discovered during the investigations and actual documentation and hard evidence. The flashback lights were used as a motive throughout the killing game to restore memory, but in reality they were writing lies to throw the group off. In the final chapter, these lights were being used to lead them to the true, despair-ridden reality of their situation, that Danganronpa is pure fiction, and they are nothing but excited fans. In order to understand the true nature of this story, it's important to break down the entire scope of Killing Harmony's setting. Because Danganronpa is its plot, understanding the story here will help us understand what V3 was trying to do and why it doesn't work well in the interactive form it was presented in. Think of meta-commentary as a series of layers which go further and further downward. Similar to how Limbo in the movie Inception takes place in the fourth layer of subconsciousness, the characters who are participating in a class trial in the final chapter of Danganronpa V3 are a few layers into its own meta-commentary. The surface is the world we live in right now, a world where a person named Matthew Lucas uploads media analysis videos to a YouTube channel called MML's Commentaries. In this world, Danganronpa is a media franchise owned and published by Spike Chunsoft and distributed to Sony gaming platforms and PC via Steam and similar clients. The only function this world serves in Danganronpa is to give the player a means of interacting with the product they purchase through the characters they control. This world is rarely addressed in Killing Harmony outside of tutorials. Below this layer is another layer, which the characters of Danganronpa refer to as the real world. This is a world where a set of 16 high school students became fans of a media franchise called Danganronpa and volunteered to participate in a televised production of the 53rd entry of the franchise. This production is made by the company Team Danganronpa, not Spike Chunsoft, as Spike Chunsoft does not exist in this world. The main hook of this particular season of Danganronpa is Kibo's inner voice, which actually gives the audience a means of having direct input in the killing game. Essentially, if Killing Harmony was a visual novel in this layer, the main character of that product would be Kibo, not Shuichi. Every time Kibo talks about his inner voice, that's actually the audience telling him what to do. Next is the world outside of the Academy for Gifted Juveniles. This world largely doesn't exist in any capacity. Only a small piece of it resides outside of this door at the end of the Death Road minigame 
game as a means of convincing the cast of its existence. This is a world ravaged by meteorites and natural disaster to the point of becoming unsustainable for human life. That's when the Gopher Project was started as a means of preserving the human race. Finally, there's the Academy itself. Not a distinctly new meta layer, but part of the same fictional world. According to the lore, the Academy for Gifted Juveniles is actually a spaceship, the key part of the Gopher Project. It returned to Earth so life could start anew, but because Earth is unsustainable, the students are trapped in the Academy. In reality, this spaceship is best described as a set for the Danganronpa television program people in the layer above are watching. Everything about this deepest layer, the world, the academy, even the personality traits and backstories of the entire cast are entirely made up. In fact, a decent amount of the backstory of this fictional world was thrown together last minute. Once the characters discovered that there was no point to leaving the school, Samugi needed to find some way for the killings to continue. After Kokichi claimed to be the mastermind, Samugi used that information to try to put a target on his back. She connected the plot of this killing game with the plot of Danganronpa's first killing game, but the plots of those two seasons didn't perfectly mesh. It left just enough holes for the characters to eventually discover that something is wrong and uncover the big despair-filled truth that is realized in most Danganronpa entries. It's a lot to process, but it all works as a means of setting up the twist that Kadaka wanted to make and setting up to communicate the themes he wanted to tell. But through telling this story in the interactive medium, Kadaka managed to confuse his audience and let the narrative fall in on itself instead of actually getting to the heart of Danganronpa's moral. The reason why many people, including myself, despised this ending at first is that they felt Kadaka was calling them out for liking the product he created. They believed that the fictional characters within this piece of art were calling out its very audience for enabling the creation of the killing games in spite of how based in reality they may or may not be. They believed that Danganronpa was saying that Danganronpa itself was bad, and that we as players should stop participating. This logic is backed up by what is easily the most interesting part of the entire chapter, where Shuichi decides to not participate and players are supposed to let the timer run out on all of the mini games they've been playing in class trials for the whole franchise. But what this logic ignores is the fact that Shuichi isn't talking to this audience, he's talking to the audience of the world of Danganronpa, one one layer below our reality, and that audience is in a universe where 16 high school aged fans volunteered to join the killing game. Even if the identities of those characters were completely rewritten, that doesn't change the fact that Kaede Akamatsu is dead among all the other characters who died in the killing games. In that universe, the pain is real, the sacrifice is real, and the despair is real. If Kanaka really wanted to make the players of our world hate Danganronpa, then he'd have to take a markedly different approach to not only how the narrative is told, but also with how players interacted with it. And there are very few instances where developers have successfully managed to design their product in a way to get players to actively hate it, with the Stanley Parable and Undertale being the two most notable examples. At the very least, he wouldn't have had the remaining cast ultimately all survive and have a happy ending. In reality, the more likely possibility for what Kadaka was actually trying to do here was to showcase characters discovering meaning and purpose in situations which seem hopeless and purposeless, a goal which he has been trying to accomplish since the very first Danganronpa entry. In all of these final chapters, the characters of these stories are bombarded with truth after truth, despair after despair, but they manage to find purpose in spite of that hardship. In Trigger Happy Havoc, not only were the families and friends of all of the main characters killed, but the entire world they knew had been brought to shambles. Despite this, the characters chose to defeat the mastermind, leave the academy, and press forward. In Goodbye Despair, the cast learns that not only is their entire world a simulation, but that this simulation was rigged by them to make them kill each other, and that shutting down the game would likely make them lose their memories. Despite this, they chose to create their own future, shut down the game, and press on into the world outside of the simulation. Killing Harmony, then, is the logical progression of this escalation. Here, the cast discovers that everything they know and feel is not only entirely fabricated, but actively enjoyed by an uncaring outside world. In addition, any sense of hope they may feel is false hope being placed in the continuation of a deadly killing game. Despite this, they ultimately decide to sacrifice themselves for the sake of changing that outside world. This plays into Killing Harmony's theme of fiction changing reality, and it only wants to connect this theming to the real world with this final image. Image. This understanding of V3's ending not only aligns with its predecessors more smoothly, but it also aligns with comments Kadaka himself has made about the title, including a number of clarifying statements which stress that the audience referenced in this case is not the same as the audience consuming the Danganronpa visual novels. 
So now that we understand this ending, we can also understand the big problem. While the thoughts and decisions of the characters make sense for those characters, players are likely to feel very differently about everything going on, as proven by the response to this ending. Ultimately, no amount of tweets or statements can change the fact that players are going to conflate this Danganronpa audience with themselves. The product itself needed to do a better job at clarifying this. Danganronpa 1 had an in-universe audience, but players never confused that audience for themselves because they did a better job at differentiating the two. Danganronpa 2 referenced the fourth wall multiple times by stating that the characters in the story were in a game, but players knew that the world outside of the Neo World simulation was different than the real world because the context with which the simulation exists in the world of Danganronpa was properly explained. Meanwhile, in Danganronpa V3, they directly ask the player if they want to remedy the situation, then pull them back into the experience as audience surrogate Kibo, immediately associating the two audiences in an irreparable way. After this point, users will only begin to conflate their reality with the meta layer below them more and more as the chapter continues to reference real-world events and locations unnecessarily, doing little else to confusing players more than they likely already are. After this, the decisions only get more and more confusing. Why is choosing despair during this non-stop debate a form of perjury? Why does control switch back and forth amongst the entire cast? Which of these characters is the player supposed to actually relate to? If the point is to stop playing Danganronpa, then why is a string of minigames where players have to do nothing, followed by an argument armament where players are supposed to participate? All of these questions have an answer, but those answers are never enough to make up for the massive discrepancies between what the characters in the story want and what the player wants. The characters hate Danganronpa, but the player loves Danganronpa. The characters hate playing minigames and answering questions, but the player loves playing minigames and answering questions. The characters find purpose in their status as fictional characters, but the player finds disappointment in what feels like a really bad bait and switch. I agree, Matthew. That is a really good point. These problems erupt solely from the fact that Danganronpa V3 is an interactive product. Meaningless or not, players have a degree of power over how they take in the narrative through how they interact with it. And while that element of interactivity has the potential to make consumers more engaged in the plot and more sympathetic towards characters they interacted as or with, it also has the potential to enable players to miss the entire point of a key narrative moment and come out of the entire experience with a false and ultimately incredibly negative perception. Kazutaka Kodaka is a fantastic writer and an incredible storyteller, but his audience completely missed the point when the means with which they interacted with that writing threw them off. These instances of ludonarrative dissonance are not instances of bad storytelling, but they are instances of bad interactive design. Danganronpa is its plot, but how that plot is shown and presented to players can affect their perception of that plot. For the duration of this video, Danganronpa has been referred to as a product, a visual novel, a story, but never a video game. In reality, however, that's exactly what Danganronpa is. Video games are interactive experiences which engage audiences in ways which simply were not possible beforehand. It's undeniably an exciting development for art and storytelling. But just like audio and visuals and color and widescreen and special effects, interactivity is a tool that needs to be used responsibly and correctly. And if a storyteller wants to use that tool, they need to design Design their art with that tool's capabilities in mind. Ultimately, artists don't know the full capability of this tool yet, and there's still a lot of discoveries to be made and hurdles to be crossed. Through dissecting stories as fantastic as the Danganronpa visual novel trilogy, and understanding how they perhaps weren't told perfectly in the interactive medium, what only becomes clearer is how exciting the future is for a video gaming genre like the visual novel. Visual novels have only gotten more popular and more prevalent in recent years, and their creators have only gotten more and more ambitious. Some have issues far worse than Danganronpa, and others have nothing but a few minor kinks, but their very existence only serves to make the tool of interactivity more versatile, make the artist's knowledge of that tool more refined and make the creations that ultimately get released that much better. Or, to put it more simply, Danganronpa may not be perfect, but Danganronpa gives me hope. Hello. We're still here at the trial. I, I figured it'd be weird if I just appeared on video after like appearing in weird Danganronpa style photos in the trial setting for the video. So everyone else has left, you know, Monokuma left. 
he, he, he's gone. He went to make his Mario and Luigi video or something. I want this video to hit an hour because the goal is that I'm not going to make hour long videos in the future. Hopefully the scripts will be shorter, but I mean, who knows where the scripts will take me, right? But the hope is they'll be shorter. So if I hit the hour now, then I won't ever be like, I want to make an hour long video. Hopefully that just won't come up again. And then that'll be great uh, because this video was a behemoth. Thank you so much for watching. This took 250 hours ish of my time. I mean, like just for the visuals, uh, the last half of this video took me the entirety of this past weekend. Uh, that was half of the visuals. That doesn't count the other half of the visuals and the audio and the capturing footage and the dog footage and all of this other stuff and the UI that was there as well. I, I had to build that from scratch. So this took a lot. But I'm very, very proud of the final result, and uh, my whole goal is to just always get better. So hopefully this was better than the last one, and hopefully the next one will be better than this. But hopefully the next one won't take 250-ish hours. Uh, so special thanks also to the voice talent. Um, all the people that kind of popped in every now and again. I figured if you have this hour-long behemoth of a video, you need to break it up with some goofs. So thanks for the goofs. But there's a bunch of other people I want to thank as well. They're all in the credits on the side of the screen here. Uh, so then you can also check the links in the description, which also link to those various people and things. Uh, so I have two announcements, and then I'll recommend you some videos, and then hopefully we'll hit that hour mark, and it'll be great. If it this is like 59, 59, I'll be very upset. I might just like lengthen it just like an extra second of black just to make it anyway. So, okay, I made this video and you're like, oh, how can I support you? Well, I mean, there are things that you already know you can do and I'm not even going to say like, go subscribe the, the bell or like share the video or whatever, right? All these things that you already know you can do, but you can also financially support the channel through Patreon, which is uh, a platform that a lot of uh, independent creators use in order to basically crowdfund some extra funding, right? Uh, I've never made a video on a zero budget in the past year uh, so uh, the funding would go directly towards funding future videos and then you get some scripts and bonus content and previews and all that fun stuff but uh, I won't talk to you directly you don't get like any extra privileges with me as a patron just because I don't know who you are and I don't want to know who you are because ethical reasons and I don't want to know who gives me money and all that fun stuff so I have this other announcement, uh, it's a bigger announcement, and if you've already sat through me rambling for this long, and the video before, so I'm not expecting too many people to pick up on this right away, but uh, I have a Discord server now, and if you don't know what Discord is, it's basically this fusion of like Skype and TeamSpeak and Slack and other sort of apps like that. Uh, they give you a platform to communicate with a bunch of different people. People with fan bases make these servers because then their fans can like connect with each other because the whole idea is that if you're watching the same creator, uh, if you sat through an hour long video about a visual novel trilogy, then you probably have some things in common. So then you could join the server and then meet people like that. And a lot of the friends that appeared in this video, I met through Discord servers and most of them were like, you know, fan Discord servers for uh, various YouTubers that I enjoy, some of which are now my friends as well. So I'm hoping that it isn't just like, oh, you can just talk to me. I hope it's also like you join, right? And then you meet other people and then you make friends and it's all this great time because it, it, I, my friend group, if you will, has like immensely grown through uh, platforms like this. So I'm hoping to provide that platform for other people. So with those main announcements out of the way, I have some videos that I want to recommend to you all because there's the two boxes in the end screen and there's little cards that are going to pop up in a bit here. Uh, so I figure I can recommend some of my other stuff and tell you what to do next. So the first thing I want to recommend to you is the last video I made, which is about Monopoly. That, you know, the board game you play with your family, you put up the houses and the hotels, and you either hated it, or you loved it, or maybe you, maybe you kind of were just somewhere in between and just like whatever, I'll just get a community chess card or whatever. Uh, so I made a video about it because it's broken. The, ga the game itself is fundamentally broken in the sense that there's a dominant strategy. So if you know the strategy, then you're more likely to win the game. And then people that don't know the strategy are more likely to lose the game if they're playing against people that know it. So it's all about dominant strategies and why you know why it's important that the, it, this exists in Monopoly because it was it, it was put in intentionally it wasn't like a oh we forgot or whatever because Monopoly is a very interesting history behind it so hopefully that video will be interesting to you it's much shorter than this one so that's great 
But if you want something longer, if you just have another hour on your time, you're just like, I'm not doing anything today. Well, I made a 45 minute video about The End is Nigh, which was my game of the year last year, uh, because it's just a fantastic platformer, uh, first and foremost. But then what the video talks about is stuff like evaluation, uh, difficulty, and completion metrics. So it's talking about basically everything, how the game's arranged, all the collectibles, all the things you do in the game are sort of arranged in a way that it, it's just like perfect. Like everything you do comes back later on and has like there's there's like always like some sort of feedback for what you do. So if you're collecting a bunch of stuff, all of those things that you collect will get you things later on. And it's not a sort of thing where it's like, oh, you get 120 stars in Mario 64 and you get to see a Yoshi. The completion metrics in the end is not uh, in the end is nigh is, are just like fantastic. It's like the perfect collectathon. Uh, and it's a 2D platformer that's great, and it's made by the guy that made Super Meat Boy and Binding of Isaac, and he has a Kickstarter going on either now or it just ended for a card game, so that's fun. Uh, but that, that's the other video that I, I, I made and I'm recommending to you. So hopefully I rambled long enough. Hopefully we're basically at the hour mark, and if not, then I have 20 more seconds for the end screen to pop up, and you to hopefully uh, it hopefully hits an hour in, in that in, in that time. I'm gonna go now. Uh, it, it's kind of hot in here and you know i, I want to go back to the the dorms in, in danganronpa whatever number this is in this weird universe where we're arguing about games their visual novels or whatever you want to call it i i, I, don't, I don't know I, i'm just gonna go now a trial adjourned uh matt listen okay i know you said you just need a voice clip but listen i'll give you some um, I, I took the creative liberty here, so I'll give you one where it's just me standing like this, you can cut the audio. But I'm gonna do a few where like I walk in, I take the glasses off, I realize there's a nice blue curtain, maybe you can like blue screen me into your footage, listen, it's up to you, but I'm um, just saying blue screen me into your footage. Hey, no matter I'm gonna do it with the glasses, Jesus Christ. What he said, I agree with that. That's some good stuff right there, fam. I'm down. I'm... Yeah. Oh, Jesus. I'm gonna spend a whole five bucks on Amazon.